All right, we are live. Just reminders. Sent out the announcement on Blackboard so that it went out, set it in class. It's live on our uh, on the live stream. Lab practical, it's live. Closes at 11.30 on Friday. Right. The lecture exam goes live tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning. All right, it's in two parts. Part one is the general questions. Um, so that's where we ask, you know, maybe common names, disease names, general questions, just kind of like what, what we've normally had. Uh, that is 60 questions. You have 75 minutes to take it. And then part two is the life cycle, uh, life cycle portion of the exam. There's 40 questions. They gave you 50 minutes to take it. But instead of being out of 40 points, it's out of 30 points. So there's a, an extra built in. Uh, it probably, if it gives, I don't know if it gives you like a percentage grade, just take whatever you score out of 40 and divide that by 30. Uh, and, and we won't do like extra credit, like bonus on top of that. All right, we've got something else in mind that, that you'll get, you'll see. All right. So those are due 1130 on Friday. And again, don't wait until Friday night to do it because there's three things that you have to get done. If you start one thing, well, I'm going to start part one and then I'll continue part two. Well, if part one doesn't finish until 11.45, you're, you're done. You can't start anything else. So get on that, get them done. Uh, we won't meet for class on Friday. I will be available. Uh, so if you're taking it you know, at this time, um, you, you can do it. Or if you had questions and you wanted to come in and, and add some final questions before you do it later that day, we could also do that. So I'll, I'll come in here, but if no one's here five minutes in, I'll, I'll just head back to my office. And I won't like record it or stream it. So if you're looking for some answers to questions, you need to be here. All right. All right. So we are transitioning to a new file. And um, I'll apologize. Because there are some other things that we're gonna we were we were supposed to do, but when I looked at like how many weeks we actually have left, I said, well, we'll cover the acanthocephalins, but we we won't we'll hold off on the pentastomes and the nematomorphs. Uh, and if we finish the protozoans, then we'll come back to those. But uh, we we need to get the protozoans because it's those are pretty important uh, in terms of human diseases and, and stuff. So what we're gonna do is do the acanthocephalin. Right, new phylum. Right, these are the thorny-headed worms. Different textbooks put them in, in different places. Sometimes they occur before the nematodes, sometimes they occur after the nematodes. Doesn't really matter. We're in a new new phylum. All right, so these are the thorny-headed worms. You've, I'm sure you've, uh, you've seen them in zoology, if you took zoology. Uh, they're named because they have a proboscis that has hooks on them. That's their anterior end, hence the thorny-headed worm. These are cosmopolitan in distribution. You're going to find acanthocephalins throughout the globe. Uh, but there's only about 1,100 described species, so it's not a particularly large group. Uh, and we probably, we're probably not missing many. Like, as you'll see with like some of the protozoans, some of the nematodes, we said, well, estimated numbers, uh, it's kind of what, what we have. Well, this is 1,100 described species. They're fairly large. You're probably not going to miss them, so yeah, it's not overly overly abundant. All of the individuals in this phyla are endoparasitic. All right, they're going to have aquatic life cycles. They can have terrestrial life cycles. They're going to infect vertebrates. They're going to infect invertebrates. All right, typically the vertebrate host will be the definitive host, and an invertebrate is the intermediate host, but. Uh, it just kind of depends on, on what life cycle you're talking about. All of our worms are dioecious. So you're going to have separate sexes, and most of them will exhibit sexual dimorphism. The most common type will be that the, uh, the males are going to be larger than, 
I'm sorry, the females are going to be larger than the males. Now, phylogenetic relationships or the systematics of these things are not 100% clear. All right? it's, they've been kind of placed in their own phylum, and that's how we're going to, to keep them as a phylum of canthocephala. But it's unknown if these are actually a true phylum. Uh, when they do sequencing, so you've got, you know, this is just kind of a, a, a tree here. Here's our, your canthocephalins. These are your ro rotifers. And it all, it's almost like our canthocephalins are highly modified rotifers. Now, if this is representative of a, new, of a true phylum, then this is their sister. Their sister to the rotifers. But if they're not, you know, if they're not distinct enough to, to place as separate phylum, then they're probably, they're, they should be grouped with the rotifers, which is interesting. They've got, they have a lot of the same, uh, same body types. I, I should say development, a lot of the same development. Tell me how. Oh, yeah, so I don't know this one. Pants? Higher. Show task bar on all displays. No, I did not want to see that. There, that, that's better. All right. Did you get this? All right, general morphology. We're going to breeze through some of these slides. Uh, I do have handouts that have these diagrams out there, and you've probably already seen these, at least some of the slides of our canthocephalus. All right, so our worms are going to vary in size. Some of them are as small as two millimeters. Some of them can grow upwards of, of an entire meter in length. Now, those are going to be longer and thinner, but um, yeah, would be you do have that size. Most of them, though, are going to be in like the one to two centimeter range. Now, with our body plan, there's, there's three generalized regions. There's the proboscis region, which is up near the head, the proboscis region. This will be the armed part of it. There's the neck region, which is part of the, part of the proboscis. It's a smooth area. It's a transition between the armed proboscis and that last region, which is the trunk. Now, as, you, as you're going to see... We have different regions based on their uh, lacunar system or lacunar system, all right, which is like a fluid-filled system. We'll talk about that. If we base it on that, those systems, then they have what's called the presoma. That includes the proboscis, the neck, and all the attached muscles and organs that are required to operate that. So that's like one type of system. And then you have the rest of the trunk, which is called the metasoma. All right, so three generalized regions of the proboscis neck and the trunk, and then if you'd say, you know, the regions of the lacunar system, it would be the presoma and the metasoma. And we'll see those again when we talk about the, the this, uh, lacunar system. Ready? All right, so the proboscis is the primary attachment organ. It's also unique to the group, that's, that's why it was named. Uh, What's important about the proboscis is that this provides temporary attachment, and that's significant. We don't really, I don't mention any of the pathology here because it's all in like animals, all right? It's very rare for a human to ever get a canthocephalin, and even if it is, it's accidental. But these things will burrow into the intestinal epithelium. The hooks help keep it in, in place, but then they can retract it and detach, and that constant, that temporary attachment and then reattachment is a source of pathology. So much so that sometimes these things can actually pierce and perforate the, the intestine. And that could result in rapid death, in, especially in some mammals. Now the proboscis is gonna be variable in shape. And with that variable in shape, we're talking about the lengths, we're talking about the number of hooks, the shape of the hooks, the arrangement of hooks, and all this other stuff. So you can see it just kind of grabbed uh, proboscis, uh, 
a variety of proboscis from a textbook. So you can see, you know, their arrangements. Some of them are located right near the tip. Others, the hooks run the entire length of the proboscis. Some of them, you have a lot of hooks. Some of them are a few hooks. Uh, I think we have two different proboscis types uh, available on slides in our lab. Now this proboscis is retractable uh, and the worm can pull it back into its proboscis receptacle. This proboscis receptacle is a muscular or blind sac which would hold the proboscis when it's retracted. Now this entire area has its own lacunar system which is a fluid filled canal system and it's thought that this system is probably what aids in proboscis movement. Maybe not complete retraction, but if it's retracted and the body squeezes, you can force the fluid directly into the proboscis, which then causes it to evert. Let me fix that. Uh, the ganglia, cerebral ganglia, are located in the receptacle. So how does it get, so you can squeeze the fluid filled system to fill up the proboscis to get it to avert. How do you pull it back in they, if they have uh, proboscis inverter muscles that will help pull it back in. And as it pulls in, that liquid in the proboscis has to go someplace. They'll go into a structure called lemnisci, which again, we'll, we'll see those. I have those defined. Questions on the proboscis? Proboscids. We good? All right, so the neck is pretty simple. This is basically the smooth region of, of the proboscis. They also have muscles called the neck retractor muscles. So we've got pro proboscis retractor muscles, neck retractor muscles. Uh, we're not going to see these in any of our slides. You may be able to see uh, the proboscis retractor muscles. Those are typically easier uh, observed, more easily observed in unstained specimen. This region may contain lateral sense organs, kind of help help the canthocephalum locate where they are in the intestine. The electron micrograph here, so you've got your proboscis, and then the neck region is that smooth region. The trunk is the body proper. All right, so this is a fluid-filled cavity. It's going to contain the re reproductive organs and its own lacunar system. Now the reproductive organs in this group are rather interesting because they develop in a structure called ligament sacs, right? These ligament sacs extend from the proboscis receptacle to the genital pore, genital, genital pore, and it's going to envelope the gonads and the accessory uh, structures. Uh, it could disappear during uh, sexual mat uh, maturation, and I believe I also define these again later on. Closed in the ligament sacs. And, and when we get to the reproductive system, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the ligament sacs again. Trunk also has its own lacunar system. And again, we'll talk about it because it's a feature of these acanthocephalins. Now, the trunk may have spines embedded in the tegument, so it's thought that these spines might aid in attachment, or at least remaining inside uh, in specific locations of the intestine. Uh, and since we haven't described any mouth or anything, we're going to absorb nutrients from in, in this region. It's the largest area. This is where we're going to get our nutrients. And the tegument actually kind of supports that. The structure of the tegument supports that. Uh, that absorption is a primary mode. Mode of nutrient acquisition.
Ready? No. Nope. Nope. Ready? Yeah. All right. The tegument and the body wall consist of a complex incision, and it's arranged in three layers. We have an outer tegument, and then we've got our muscle layers, which is composed of circular muscle layer and longitudinal muscle layers. and get you situated here. The lumen of the gut is down here. So this is the exterior and then we work in. So what we're gonna do is kind of hit up each, each of these, each of these layers. So the outer tegument layer is our complex incision, basically. This is what's gonna be exposed out to the environment. The outer tegument layer is itself composed of multiple layers. It's composed of a surface coat, which is the outermost layer. We have a striped zone. We have a zone called the felt fiber zone, and then we have a radial fiber zone. And underneath that, that then we have our basement membrane and then your connective tissue and muscle layers below that. All right, so that outermost layer is the surface coat or the brush border. And we've seen that before. We've mentioned like glycocalyx was also, of uh, the platy helmets was also called like the brush coat, brush border or surface coat. So you know, it, it, this, is the, this is what interacts with our environment. So this surface coat is a plasma membrane. It's covered by a carbohydrate rich, rich glycocal glycocalyx, right, just like we've seen in the past. It has numerous infoldings and pores. Right? And why do we have that? Surface area. It's increasing surface area because we're absorbing all of our nutrients from the host itself. Now, with these pores, they're going to have the canals of those pores are going to lead to crypts. And the crypts are going to be found in the striped zone. Right, so they kind of pass through, the, the lines goes down into the stripe zone. The whole function of this outer layer, nutrient absorption and inactivation of enzymes. Right, so the inactivation of enzymes is acting as protective, as, as protection. So you can see SC is your surface coat. You've got your pores going down to the crypts. Here's the crypts. The, the crypts are marked with the C and, and so forth, so you can kind of get an idea of what the tegument might look like. So below the surface coat is the striped zone. So named because of the large number of crypts that are connected to the pores, to the, those surface pores. You have these things because that actual canal is going to limit what size of particles can make it down to the base of the crypts. So it's kind of acting as a, a selective agent. Prevents all the big stuff from getting down in the crypts, which means the only thing that really gets down there are gonna be really small mo molecules, which are then going to be absorbed. And that's the function of those things. It's penocytosis. So all of the small stuff Anything taken up through penocytosis is going to traverse those, enter the pores, go through the, the canals to get down to the base of the crypts. And just kind of as review, uh, hopefully it was covered in one of the intro bio courses, but the crypts are just basically, you could say like an inlet, a bay, you know, on, on, a, on a lake or whatever, but it's on tissue.
We've seen the crypts of Lyriki, right? What worm was that? What's that? Yep, Trichiris. Uh, Trichiris Trichiro. What's the common name of that? What? I should have had. How many people are here? Should I have like unanimous responses for that? <laughs> All right, so after the stripe zone, so more interior, we have the felt fiber zone. So named because of what felt looks like. Felt is just basically uh, packed fibers that are overlaid, all right? Densely packed, randomly arranged, it's what felt fabric looks like. All right, so in this zone, we have numerous closely packed, randomly arranged fibers. This region has many metabolically organelles, including mitochondria, Golgi, all that, all of that stuff. All right. This is a site where things that are brought in are broken down, and things that are getting ready for secretion, they're going to be processed and then sent up the line to the surface coat. So felt fiber zones all about meta being metabolically active. Ready for the next? Radial fiber zone. The radial fiber zone is the largest. It's how it's depicted in our diagram. Right. This makes up about 80% of the total thickness of the body wall. Now we're going to have radial or radially arranged filaments. That's its name, the radial fiber zone. So and extend basically that thickness. The nuclei of our complex incision are located here. And what's notable is that our nuclei typically have many nucleoli associated with it. And in many cases, these things are actually going to be fairly large, also called giant nuclei. So I believe we have some slides where those are visible giant nuclei are visible. This is also where we have uh, the lacunar canals, or at least some of the lacunar canals in here. The lacunar system goes in there, which means that anything that gets absorbed very close to the fluid-filled uh, fluid filled system, so we could transport it out to other areas of the body. All right, ready? While we're at it, let's talk about this lacunar system before we talk about the, the musculature. So this is a fluid-filled system, fluid-filled system of channels. All right, so it's gonna be in the body, it's gonna be in the proboscis. Right? And we've got actually two separate systems. We've got the one that is the presoma, that's a proboscis neck. And then we have the second system, which is the trunk. And they do appear to be separate systems, like isolated from each other. The whole purpose of this system is to carry waste and nutrients to and away from the muscles, and it acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. So you can, through muscle contractions, we can force fluid into different parts of the body to cause it to avert. For example, the proboscis. Now, when we look at this system, you've got channels, typically longitudinal channels, large ones, that are then connected through some of these lateral commissures that, that kind of go around the body, and then you have different branch points. Those canals are found in, like the primary ring are, are found in your uh, radial fiber zone, so the outer part is in the radial fiber zone, and then you have inner rings, inner chambers that are embedded in the muscle layers, embedded in the muscle layers. As we'll see, the muscles are actually hollow, 
hollow fibers. So they're a part of the musculature system too. Right? And this is something that's that's in our acanthocele bones. We haven't seen this before. All right, so the muscles. We've got longitudinal layers, and then you've got circular circular layer around that. So you've got your your tegument, the, the radial fiber zone, and then you've got your circular muscle layer and the longitudinal muscle layer underneath it. These muscle fibers are hollow, and they're continuous with the lacunar system. That means if the circular muscles contract, they're going to push fluid into longitudinal muscles. If the longitudinal muscles contract, they're going to push fluid into uh, the circular muscles. And as we all know, muscles do require a lot of ATP. They're, the process of contracting is very energetically expensive. And it's thought that one of the reasons why they're hollow, why it's part of the lacunar system, is that that system represents a very efficient transfer and transport of nutrients and wastes. And so it's thought that it's hollow because that lacunar system can, can take waste away from the muscles, can bring additional nutrients right to the muscles to where they need it. I didn't put that up here because it's kind of speculation as to why that, that is the way it is. Kind of hard to prove. But you can see that the lacunar system is in the muscle layers, but it's part of our hollow muscle fibers, and it's in our, our uh, outer tegument layer. Questions? All right, the reproductive system uh, has one or two ligament sacs that attach to the posterior end of that proboscis receptacle and extend to near the distal genital pore. So our genital pore is going to be right near the posterior part, end of the body. All right, and you've got this ligament sac structure. All of our gonads are going to develop inside of that ligament sac. End All right, so usually we do have in this diagram here, we've got a genital ligament label. So the ligament would extend and then basically be an envelope that surrounds your gonads and attaches right near the right near the genital pore. Be the male. Now it doesn't have to persist. They can they can disappear as the worm matures, or sometimes in the mature worm you're you're going to see them. I can't remember if we can. I I don't think we can see them in any of our specimens. All right, so that's the general reproductive system. What we'll do is talk about the, the two different systems, male and female systems. So ready for this? All right, so the reproductive system, the male system, general pattern is that you have generally two testes, having vas efferens, those can join up to a vas deferens, and then that goes to, the, to a, a penis. So no serous, they just decided to call it a penis. That's your sperm delivery structure. But then also in this group, we have accessory structures. One of the interesting ones, or at least what I find are in, is interesting, is what's called cement glands. These glands could be um, syncytial in nature, or they could be individual, like gland-like structures and in individual nuclei. But their purpose is to secrete copulatory cement, and that cement is made up of tanned proteins, harder proteins. Its function, or at least it's presumed the function is, uh, 
to prevent sperm transfer after copulation with the female. So males will, will grasp on using the bursa, hold the female, transfer sperm, and then use from the cement gland secretions, it'll inject and plug the vagina and just basically form what's called a copulatory cap or a copulatory plug. And that's going to prevent another male from mating with that female. That cap ends up dissolving and, and goes away after several days, but hope, it's ho hopefully at that time, the sperm of that worm has already had the chance to fertilize oocytes. Interestingly, sometimes you will find these caps, these plugs, on the outside of some of the worms, not just female worms either, but on some male worms. So I'm going to say worms are stupid. They don't know who they're trying to mate with and maybe not even know if they're in the right spot. Who knows? But you have seen these. The cement glands are, are the, just see them. And we do have we do have specimens, stained specimens, where you can see the cement gland. We mentioned this copulatory bursa. Right? We've seen copulatory bursas in our hookworms, right? and their whole function is to grasp and hold on to the females. Same idea with the acanthocephalins. It's going to grasp and hold on to the female so that it could, it could inseminate her. Now, what's different is that the copulatory bursa is bell-shaped. All right? So it's not going to have these rays or anything. It's going to be bell-shaped. And it can be retracted. So it doesn't have to be sticking out. It can be retracted in the worm and then everted again when it's, when it's ready to try to mate. So in our diagram of the male, there's our copulatory bursa. And the worm can, again, pull it back in. And I think I told some people, it's been the difficulty of working with the canthocephalins or making slides with the canthocephalins. We put them into, into water. We can cause the proboscis to, to evaginate. We can cause the bursa to evaginate. But then it almost seems like as soon as we try to fix them, kill them and fix them, they get retracted again. So it's, they're a little bit tough to work with. Or at least I found that they're a little bit tough to work with. The last accessory structure that we'll talk about is Safetogen's pouch. All right, this is a muscular stat, a muscular sac that it's attached to the base of the bursa. This is probably part of the lacunar system, uh, kind of equivalent to lemnisci, which kind of hold uh, the fluid when the proboscis retracts. So when the bursa retracts, the fluid in that bursa has to go someplace, and it's thought that it goes into Safetogen's pouch, and then. When Safetogen's pouch contracts, it forces the fluid back into the bursa, the bursa to cause it to extend. And I am just realizing that I don't have the lemnisci, lemniscus discussed. And I know I didn't. So we're going to take a detour slightly. When we talked about proboscis, you have this lemniscus. These are sacs. This is what holds the, the fluid, the lacunar fluid. Uh, and you're going to see those on some of the uh, slides that we have in the lab. It's on our word list, actually, to identify the lemnisci. And that's what they are. I don't know how that slipped through. You said it's in the proboscis. Yep, the lemniscus right here. I've got the female lemniscus here. Typically, there's two, there's two of them. Uh, lemnisci, two of them. Should have appeared here. Yeah, I think I I'm probably missed. I probably had plans to put it someplace else, and it never got in there. But um, do, do, do. Oh, I think those are the only diagrams. Yeah, those are the only diagrams. So the lemniski, lemniscus, singular, lemniski, plural. It's going to hold the uh, lacunar fluid when the proboscis retracts, and then it's going to empty uh, as the proboscis gets everted. All right, ready for the female system? 
the female system is different. Because we don't have we don't have ovaries. Instead, the ovaries are going to fragment during development to produce ovarian balls, which are clusters of oocytes. And then as the oocytes uh, start to develop, they will kind of break off of those, of those balls. So we have basically our ligament sac that's going to hold our ovarian balls, right? and it's going to hold the developing oocytes and the developing eggs. And then from there, we're going to approach what's called the, the uterine bell, which is a selection apparatus. That then goes to the uterus, to the vagina, and then the gonopore. All right, so I've already said these ovarian balls, it, it's fragmented ovary is what it is. And typically, this is going to fragment before our worm even makes it into the, de the definitive host. And these ovarian balls are going to stay, they're going to just float freely in the ligament sac. So in these worms, you're going to see some of these ovarian balls. You're going to see fertilized oocytes. You're going to see developing oocytes, developing eggs inside of them. Now, as the eggs develop, they're going to remain in that ligament sac and then get past or passes by the uterine bell. The uterine bell is a muscular funnel-shaped organ. It's going to allow mature fertilized eggs to pass through to the uterus, but it's going to return all of the immature eggs, immature fertilized eggs and immature oocytes back to the ligament sacs. So how it works is, is basically you can think of it as having a funnel-shaped slits. All right. Mature fertilized eggs are too big to go to those slits. So as they travel down that funnel, they're going to just get funneled down through that one opening that goes to the uterus. All of the immature eggs are going to be much smaller. So as they contact the sides of that funnel, they're going to find the slits and they're going to pass through those slits, which puts them right back into the ligament sac where they remain until they get large enough to where when they contact the sides, they don't go through the slits, and then they get funneled right down to the uterus. So the whole selection appears to be based on size of the eggs. Mature eggs are larger than immature eggs. Now this uterine bell, unique to the acanthocephalus. Another thing that's unique to the acanthocephalus. So as you can see in our diagram, there's really not a very large uterus, unlike our, our trematodes or, or cestodes, where you've got you know uterus filled with gravid eggs. You typically don't have that. Normally, you're going to find different stages of eggs all throughout the ligament sacs, and then only mature eggs in the uterus. Questions? All right, life cycles. Nice thing about acanthocephalin life cycle is that when you know the generalized life cycle, then about the only difference is between the species is what host it uses. All right, so what we're going to do is kind of go through the generalized life cycle where I can define uh, all of the different life cycle stages. And then we'll talk about some of the specific life cycles because another feature, another common theme of the acanthocephalin is host behavioral modification. So we'll talk about two, two different examples. So in our generalized life cycles, you're going to see a vertebrate definitive host and an invertebrate intermediate host, typically two host life cycle. Peritonic hosts are common. And when, when we're utilizing peritonic hosts, typically they're vertebrates. Typically they're, they're vertebrates. And the peritonic hosts will serve it to, to get that, that infective stage to the final host. The pattern that we see is the egg will hatch to release an acanthor, which, release, which develops into an acanthella, which develops into the infective stage, which is, which is the cystocanth. 
And then from the cystocanth, once it finds the definitive host, it will develop into an adult. So we've got three different larval stage names, acanther, acanthella, and cystocanth. So what's an acanther? An acanther is simply a larval stage with an acolyte organ. What is an acolyte organ? It's a fancy term for the hooks or spines and the associated muscles that are found on this larval stage. So this is an example of an acanthor. The acolyte organ is simply these blade-like hooks, blade-like hooks and the muscles that attach them. That's the acolyte organ. Right, nothing fancy. You do have retractor muscles. Uh, these hooks uh, probably, this whole part probably transforms into the proboscis. Not in all species. Not in all species, but, but in many of them they do. This acolyte organ has also been called the rostellum, kind of equivalent to a rostellum of a cesto. So you can go back to, to your images of rostellum of Echinococcus or Tinea uh, and see some similarities in, in our blade-like hooks. The purpose of these hooks of this organ is for penetration because the egg's going to hatch releasing this, this stage. Usually this stage is going to burrow through the intestine into the hemocele or at least burrow into the gut epithelium where it starts to develop at that point. Ready? So this stage develops into an acanthella. And the acanthella, I'm going to say, is a little bit harder to define. It's basically the intermediate stage between our acanther and the cystocanth, because our worm wants to get to the cystocanth stage. So in our acanthella, we're going to see organ systems developing. Uh, we're going to see the hypodermal nuclei developing, um, but you're, pro you're not going to see a full-fledged full proboscis yet and because that's in the cystocanth stage. So the acanthella is basically a developing cystocanth. And I, I mentioned the central nuclear mass. That's what this is, the cent central nuclear mass of our acanthor. So all of our organ systems are going to start developing from there. All right, so it's a developing, it's a developing stage. And then what we're trying to develop into is the infective stage, which is the cystocanth. So definition, textbook definition is a fully developed acanthella. All right, so that's kind of where I said it's kind of loose, loose terminology. But the cystocanth is the infective stage. We have to get to this stage in order to be infective. And usually at this stage, it's going to look at look like an immature adult. And our definition of definition of immature adult, adult is going to vary. Sometimes you're going to make out some of the general primordia. Sometimes you'll be able to see, yeah, this is a male. This is going to be a female worm. You can make that out, but you're definitely not going to see eggs. Usually, you're not going to see eggs at that point. <coughs> Usually, you're going to find these things in cysted. So the hyaline cyst, a clear like, like cyst structure. So yeah, as you can see here, testes are there. You can see cement glands. You can identify it as a male. They may not be as large as what a fully developed adult is, but typically you're going to see it. And at least at this stage, in many cases, you can get pretty close to an identification because a lot of the identifications of the acanth supplements are based on the proboscis, their hook, the hook shape, number, and arrangement. Ready? All right, so what we're going to do is end up stopping here because we're running out of time. We went through a generalized life cycle. What we're going to do now is, is go through two different species. And the common theme for the acanthocephalin is that these guys, the larval stages, manipulate host behavior. All right, there's been a lot of coevolution that's happened so that when it finds its preferred host, 
usually is going to alter the host behavior that increases the chance of predation by the definitive host. So there's going to be two species that we talk about. One of them is a terrestrial life cycle, one of them is an aquatic life cycle, uh, and we'll be able to get through this on Monday and then I, I believe maybe start our protozoans. All right, any questions? Don't forget, quizzes, exams. Quizzes and exams. And I do think for the final exam, I will make it go live on Monday morning, like early Monday morning, and it'll close by the end of the day on, on Wednesday. So if you have multiple exams on Wednesday, you can take it early. Okay. All right. All right. See some of you in lab? See at least one of you in a 